Good morning, church. All right, let's start with this congregational reading. We're going to read uh, Psalm, recite Psalm 100 together. Shout to the Lord with joy, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his court hearts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy endures forever, his faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Please sing with me, say, standing. For the beauty of the earth, for the video. Uh, thank you to everybody that put that together. Um, it's really a, a wonderful ministry that we all have. But I'd like to welcome you all here uh, this morning to the Brooks Avenue uh, Church of Christ and also those watching online on live stream. Welcome to worship with us. Thank you for being here. Um, if you are a guest today, uh, there are cards in the back of the pews uh, please fill them out, put your information on that, uh, and give it to us uh, so that we may contact you if you have any questions about the church here. Also, if you have any need, uh, if you have a prayer request, I know that the elders will be down here uh, at the end of the service. You're more than welcome to, to come forward then. But also, uh, please fill out one of the cards. You can put it in one of the box or pass it to somebody and we will uh, be happy to uh, address whatever needs you have and help in any way that we can. You also, if you're watching online or you feel more comfortable this way, uh, you can email at frontdesk at brooks.org uh, and we will respond to those as promptly as possible. Um, and just as you saw in the video here, as most are aware, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, outreaches that Brooks Avenue has done and one of the one of the wonderful events that we have done here was is the uh, carnival uh, for the special needs children uh, which allows us all uh, to get involved and uh, and work in that ministry so there is a ministry team uh, that is coming together to see if we could 
restart that program again here after COVID. And uh, obviously it will be on a smaller scale to start off. Um, that's how we, we grow into grand things uh, from one small spark. So if you would like to get some more information or you have ideas uh, for that, please email uh, that committee at frontdesk at brooks.org uh, by noon on September 23rd uh, so that we have time to continue uh, with that. Uh, one other announcement, the Hall Harbor uh, Church of Christ in the Outer Banks, uh, North Carolina, is looking for a few good men. Um, if you have a gospel message that you would like to share with them, uh, uh, please also contact us so that we can uh, get you together with them. If you would be willing to go out and speak with them, they would provide housing uh, and possibly some uh, compensation for that. And please contact Gene Goldsmith for that, uh, which you can get a hold of him through the email or in person there. He was waving his hand. Hey, Gene. <laughs> um, let's go to our Father with prayer uh, to bless this worship service to him. Our holy, mighty Father above in heaven, uh, we are here to worship you to give you glory, to sing praises to you, uh, to learn from your word, your powerful word that you give us, uh, and to take communion with one another to remember your son. We pray that you will bless uh, this worship service to you, Father. Open our hearts to you. Forgive us of our wrongs. Let us leave those at the door knowing that they're washed away from your son's blood. And we thank you so much uh, that that happened and for your grace and for your mercy. And we pray that we will worship you in fear of you, Lord, knowing that you love us with, with so much more than we even understand. Bless uh, the people leading the singing and the bringing the message and the prayers as we go throughout this service. Bless each member here and guests uh, seeking you out, seeking this personal relationship with you as we commune with each other. Uh, bless this time, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, please stand and join with me. Can you guys hear me better now? Cool. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gracefully sing His wonder.
Good morning, Brooks Avenue. It is so good to be with you, and it is an honor to be here. Um, I know many speakers, whenever they come to be able to speak to the church and the family of God that's gathered here at 700 Brooks Avenue, will often tell you, uh, wow, it is such a blessing to be here. And the reason that they tell you that is because it is. Valerie and I have a deep love for this church, and um, there is not a Sunday when we say our morning prayers that we don't pray for the church here at Brooks Avenue. And, um, and we have been so blessed by this church and the relationships that we have here and the deep friendships that were formed through the years, and it is indeed a blessing to be with you. And thank you for inviting us back. Um, and also, if you're watching us online, we are so honored that you have chosen to join us as well and glad that you're here. And uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would right now, to go ahead and open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to be in the uh, look at a, a story out of the life of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. But let me begin this morning by telling you a pro football story. You know, we are in the second week of the new NFL season. And this story goes all the way back to 1985. There was a guy named John Cassis who um, wrote about a time that he was in the locker room of the 1985 Chicago Bears. It was the day of a big game, and it was a home game. And Coach Mike Dicka was about to give a pep talk to the team before they began the process of dressing out and going out on the field. But before Ditka began addressing the team, Coach Mike Ditka, he uh, motioned over to William, the refrigerator Perry, all 300 pounds of him, and said out loud to the team and to William, William, I want you to lead the Lord's Prayer when I'm done speaking to the team. When Coach Ditka said that, Jim McMahon, who was the brash and sometimes abrasive quarterback of the Chicago Bears, punches John Cassius in the ribs because Cassius was serving as the volunteer chaplain for the Chicago Bears. And he whispers to Cassius, and he says, There is no way the fridge knows the Lord's Prayer. Cassa says, man, everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. And McMahon, with a nod of his head, pointed to the fridge. Cassus looks at the fridge, and he is sweating bullets. Drops of sweat are, 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 are dropping off of his forehead, and he looks confused, and he's somewhat disoriented. While Ditka continues to give his pregame remarks. Now McMahon looks to Cassus and says, I bet you $50 he doesn't know the Lord's Prayer. Cassus said, I'll take that bet because everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. So finally Ditka finishes. And he looks to the fridge. And he says, now William, will you please lead us in the Lord's Prayer? William the refrigerator Perry stands up and his presence takes up a lot of space. And he begins to go back and forth on his feet. And he begins to stare down as he closes his eyes. And here's what he begins to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And just as the words came out of Perry's mouth... Elbows find Cassus' ribs one more time. And McMahon looks shocked and surprised. And he hands a $50 bill over to John Cassus. And he says as he does it, I can't believe it. The fridge knows the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> now, have you ever known people, or maybe been one, where you thought you knew how everything was going to go and how everything was going to turn out, 
only to find out you didn't. Sometimes we want to think that our journey of faith, whenever we become Christians, are going to, is going to be this linear journey. But oftentimes, what ends up happening in my life, and maybe your life, but it's certainly in my life, is my faith journey, if it's plotted out, it doesn't look anything like a linear journey. If anything, it looks like a four-year-old has taken a crayon and just scribbled all over the paper, and you really can't figure out where the beginning point is and where the end point is. Because the faith that you end up when you die sometimes looks little like the faith you started out with when it began. Because one of the things about faith is that over time, faith grows, faith dislodges, faith comes back, faith extends, faith has some elasticity to it. One of my favorite writers is a guy named Walter Brueggemann. And Walter Brueggemann wrote a really fantastic book about the Psalms. And in his book about the Psalms, he talks about how that the faith journey is kind of like... Uh, like this, and I think there's a slide that's going to come up, that there are three stages of a faith journey. That there is orientation, there is disorientation, and then there is reorientation. And I think Brueggemann is on to something here. As a matter of fact, when you think about stories in the Bible, I would submit to you that most, if not all, stories in Scripture include these three phases of faith. Every story that I, almost every story that I can think of in Scripture includes some of this, this faith journey of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And think about how you see these three things play out in your own life. That every one of us in here, if there is a common thread that runs through the fabric of the audience this morning, every one of us in here can almost relate the times where we have been in times of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And it seems like it is a natural and normal thing, and we all go through it. And sometimes we go through it multiple times. And there are times when it seems that we are at a cognitive dissonance with our faith. This orientation, disorientation, reorientation. And what's strange about it is they all have different lengths. For instance, orientation just seems to happen somewhat naturally. But disorientation seems to come upon us somewhat suddenly. It could be a quick moment. It could be a free fall. It could feel like the rug has suddenly been pulled out from under you. And reorientation often feels like it just takes way too long that sometimes that reorientation process is months, years, decades. And by the way, reorienting can be a disorienting experience. And it happens to God's people. In the Old Testament, God's chosen people went through an entire disorienting experience of their faith and a very slow reorientation. There is a period known in the Old Testament as the exile. And the exile for the people of God was a 70-year experience. Now, the disorientation phase happened in weeks. Well, maybe not, maybe years. But the reorientation phase was, was a long time. And even when it was over, it cast a shadow on the people of God. The Jewish people had made a decision to chase after other gods. They had been warned repeatedly by the prophets of God, turn back to God. Stop chasing foreign gods. Stop following false gods. And if you don't do this, a judgment is coming upon you. By the way, Here's kind of a side point of the sermon. There may be times in your life when God goes against you because he is ultimately for you. There may be times that God goes against you because he is ultimately for you. 
Now, going back to the children of Israel. Babylon, the most powerful nation of the day, has invaded the people of Israel. They, it, they have invaded their land. They have decimated their crops. They have plundered their wealth. They have murdered many. They have dragged away the people to Babylon hundreds of miles away. As a matter of fact, many scholars believe it could have been as many as 200 to 300,000 people. And some of the young men that were taken from their homeland to Babylon were put into an ancient version of a chain gang. And they provided all the physical labor for Babylon as they built their buildings and built their civilization and built the things that they would be remembered for. But Babylon was smart. They also took a smaller group of these young Jewish men and decided to elevate them into the royal kingdom, into the royal household. And some of these Jews would have influence and they would have political power. But understand, they were not free. And Babylon was intentionally trying to indoctrinate them. Or at least deeply assimilate them into Babylonian culture. And for three years, these young men are exposed to all things Babylon. They are exposed to Babylonian gods, Babylonian education... Babylonian arts, Babylonian food, the Babylonian language, the Babylonian history. And a guy named Daniel was one of those who was in the royal court. Now there are a lot of stories about Daniel that we remember. We remember the story of the lion's den. We remember Daniel's courage. As a matter of fact, one of the first songs that I can remember learning and going to vacation Bible school when I was a kid at the Glenwood Drive Baptist Church was the song, Dare to Be a Daniel. Dare to Stand Alone. There are a lot of stories about Daniel we remember, but let's start with the very first story. So, Begin with me in Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read out loud verses 3 through 7, and it's also going to be up on the screen as well. This is from the New International Version. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his royal officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, to Azariah, Abednego. Now, we recall the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That is a great story, but that's another story for another time. But at least here we are introduced to them. And I want you to notice that part of the assimilation process early on was that they're going to change these young men's names. And are going to attempt to change, by changing their names, their very identity. For instance, Hananiah, who would become Shadrach. Hananiah means a gift from Yahweh. But now his new name, Shadrach, means under the command of the moon god. Mishael, which is the Hebrew version of Michael. Mishael is who is like the mighty one, who is like the mighty Yahweh. But now his name is Meshach, and Meshach means who is as great as Aku, the moon god. And then Azariah, who will become Abednego. Azariah, whose name means helped by Yahweh. His new name, Abednego, means who is as great as the god Nebo. And Belteshazzar means the god Baal protects the king. Isn't it interesting 
that it's always been a strategy of the enemy that if you can get people to change their names and identity you begin and you begin to unwind their identities and you give them a name that invokes an unfamiliar god that's what they do here in this story and by the way how do you begin to reorient when that happens to you when your identity and all that you have counted on are assumed as not just challenged but attempted to be undone but what is fascinating with Daniel is where he draws the line. So much of Daniel's story is beyond his control. Daniel cannot control the name change. Daniel cannot control the education. Daniel cannot control the culture. Daniel may could not even have controlled what was done to him physically. Because many commentators believe that Daniel and his three friends most likely are made into eunuchs. That as young men, when they enter the royal household, they are, uh, there is something done physically to them. And there are a lot of things that are beyond Daniel's control. But there is one thing he can control. I am not going to defile myself with the king's food and wine. So, let's pick up in verse 8, read through verse 14. It'll be up on the screen as well. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had called the chief official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel... I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned you food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. But Daniel then said to the guard and the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. By the way, do you notice in verse 11 that the Jewish names are used? Why the Jewish names? Here's why. Because Daniel's writing the story. Now, do you wonder what was it that made Daniel draw the line in the sand with this act? Maybe the king's food wasn't kosher and the king's table included some pulled pork barbecue or maybe some shrimp scampi. Maybe. Maybe Daniel is just drawing a line to be able to keep his distinction Perhaps Daniel is starting the entire reorientation process. Everything that he knows has been completely taken away from him. He is completely disoriented and he is trying to be faithful to his God in a foreign land where he is surrounded by foreign gods and where his life can be taken from him at any moment. And there's nothing he can do. And I wonder if Daniel just wanted that one thing. That one thing that reminded him on a daily basis that three times a day when he sat down to eat, this is who I am. I am a true child of the one God, Yahweh. I belong to the true God regardless of what they call me. I belong to Yahweh regardless of what they tell me. I belong to Yahweh regardless of what they do to me. I am a child of God. By the way, you ever felt like you've been in a foreign environment? Maybe it's a medical diagnosis. You go to the doctor for one thing and something else is found that you were totally not expecting. And it disorients you. And it puts you in a type of exile. That the things you knew and you thought you could count on or being taken away or maybe at risk and, and it feels like exile. 
And maybe as a nation, we feel like we're in exile today. There are ways that we are treating one another and the values that we thought we had that we don't have and the fights that are happening and the polarization that is occurring. And then you factor in COVID, which was just um, it's like the tectonic plates have shifted. So when you're feeling an exile, when do you assimilate and when do you draw the line in the sand? Because one of the things you can do when you find yourself in exile is you can dare to be a Daniel. You can draw a line in the sand and say enough and do the one thing that is distinct and remind you of who and whose you are, that you are a follower of God, that you are a child of the king. And Daniel would not acculturate. Rather, Daniel chooses a harder option. But it's a riskier option. It is a more exciting option. And he chose to be what Peter, over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, would call us and, and, and say that we are called to be a peculiar people. Now, peculiar doesn't mean weird. And it also doesn't mean that you get to be a jerk. Being a jerk is not a gift of the Spirit. Kind of resonate a little bit with what John, John Ortberg writes in one of his books. He says, It seems to me that a lot of Christians say it is just too hard to be holy, so I'm just going to be weird. That's not what this means. What Peter means when he calls us a peculiar people is that we are different, that we are distinct that we are set apart, that we choose to swim upstream in a downstream world. And it doesn't mean separate. Isn't it interesting in the story of Daniel, Daniel was not separate from Babylon. He was deeply engaged. He was deeply involved. But he was set apart. And by the way, that is still a massive challenge for us who are followers of God and disciples of Jesus Christ. What does it mean for us to be set apart? Where do we draw the line? Because in these disorienting days in which we are living, it is really easy for us to want to assimilate too much and to forget who we are and to forget who our king is. Because if you forget those things, the world is very quick to want to remind you of their identity for you. And maybe a takeaway from the life of Daniel is to put something in your life that reminds you consistently. Because for Daniel, it was three times a day at every meal. He's eating those vegetables and he's drinking that water. And his table time was a reminder that he is a child of God, that he has different values, and that he wants to be distinct. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why in just a few moments we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Because every week the Lord's Supper reminds us of who we are and whose we are. And that we come together around the table to be reminded that we are a saved people and we are a distinct people. So, let's pick up verses 15 through 17. At the end of ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel can understand visions and dreams of all kinds. By the way, if you're a vegan, this is your go-to Bible verse right here to justify. Um... But I also feel like I need to give us a little bit of a warning out of this story. We read the book of Daniel, 
And it almost feels like as if at every story, somehow or another, Daniel comes out on top. Now, I love Daniel's story. But I got to tell you, that ain't mine. That's not always guaranteed for any of us. Studying Daniel, everything seems to turn out good for Daniel. But that's not always true for you and me. And when we find ourselves in exile and disoriented, put a name to that disorientation because it is exile. Because things do feel foreign. And when you're reorienting, the very act of reorienting can itself be disorienting. So let me encourage you, church, four ways to dare to be a Daniel. And here's the first one. Recognize that God works differently through different people. Recognize that God works differently through different people. In your Bibles, the books of Daniel or the books of Esther and Daniel are separated by just a few hundred pages in your Bible. However, their stories happen at about the same time in history, during the exile. But Esther and Daniel have two totally contrasting styles. For instance, Daniel never hides who he is. Daniel doesn't seek confrontation, but he has clear lines that he will not cross. However, Esther, her uncle Mordecai, commands her not to reveal her origins and identity when she enters the royal household. Daniel, he won't eat the royal food. Esther, it's almost as if she'll eat whatever's put in front of her. Daniel's life and story is full of references to God. But God, though he is the major character in every Bible book, regardless of the name of the person in the book, God is never mentioned by name in this book of Esther. Yet, God is still at work in both of their lives. He is front and center in Daniel's story, but he's behind the scenes and at work in Esther's story. And God is at work and using other people just like he is at work in, with, and through you. And just because God's work looks different in somebody else's life than the way that you think it ought to look because this is the way it looks in your life, it's a reminder for us, maybe we need to be gracious to one another. And understand that the same God that's working in you is working in them. And it may look totally different. But God's purposes will be accomplished. Here's the second thing. Recall who and whose you are. Recall who and whose you are. You know, isn't it interesting how in our culture today identity is such a big thing? And all the different branches of identity and the ways that the world... And, and even our, we ourselves sometimes want to define ourselves. It seems as if it is the central issue around which several current cultural storms just rage. But Daniel remembers who he is. And he also remembers whose he is. That he belongs to Yahweh. That regardless of his physical address that regardless of where he finds himself, regardless of the situations or the circumstances that he wishes were different, he knows he belongs to God and he remembers who he is and he remembers whose he is. Here's the third thing. React with faith and wisdom. React with faith and wisdom. Daniel chooses one thing. Just one thing. By the way, here's a good definition of exile. Exile means that regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how bad things may get, regardless of how displaced you may feel, you can be faithful to God. You can be faithful to God. It will not be easy. It won't always be clear. 
And it most always will cost you. But you can be faithful to God. But exile also means this. God is faithful to you. Even when it's not always the way you thought it would be. Even when it feels like, you know what, this is, this is not the story that I thought I would have. Or even when it means that, that this is not what I want. God is still faithful. That when circumstances disorient us, regardless if it's culture, regardless if it's a medical diagnosis, regardless if it's family, whatever it is, we sometimes can start to wonder if we can stay faithful to God. And exile is a reminder that regardless of the circumstance, you have the capacity to be faithful to God. And that's good news. It's not always easy, it's not always clear, and it most always will cost you. But here's more good news. Exile means God's faithful to you. It may not always be what you want. It may not always be what you thought. But do not let what is wrong with you keep you from remembering what is right with God. That God is faithful. And here's the last thing. Remember the mission. Remember the mission. And maybe as we live in the times that we live in, maybe we don't need to storm as much about the sin and evil of the world as much as we need to live an obedient lifestyle, showing the world a fleshly example of what a better alternative lifestyle looks like. That when it comes to life, what life can be like in journeying with Jesus, maybe we need to do something that I used to do when I was a kid at Thomasboro Elementary School every Tuesday for probably grades first and second and maybe in the third. And here's what it was. Show and tell. I love show and tell. I didn't like participating in it because I didn't have much to show and I knew less than I, than I could tell. But I loved hearing other people. And I, I love show and tell. Um, and isn't it interesting it's in that order. Show and tell. Now, there have been a lot of times in my life when I've wanted to tell before I showed. I probably end up showing my tail. <laughs> but we live in Babylon. And being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that we are called to resent Babylon. But it also doesn't mean that we are called to resemble it either. And maybe we live in a time where it's time for some show and tell. Christine Kane is part of a church in Australia. She lives in Australia. And several years ago, on a music tour, she uh, brought her daughter for the United States for the first time. And of all the things her young daughter wanted to do when she came to the United States, here was her number one request. She wanted to go to Walmart. I know, and that's crazy to say. She wanted to go to Walmart. That's where her daughter wanted to go. So Christine tells the story that as they walk into Walmart, she tells her daughter, I'll buy you one thing in Walmart. Anything you want, but one thing. And of everything in Walmart Christine's daughter wanted to buy, she selected a flashlight. And it was a flashlight in the brightest color. The case was brightest color available. And, and then they buy some batteries as they're checking out. And they go through the line and they pay for the flashlight and the batteries. And the daughter cannot wait. And she just pulls over to the side before they go outside. And she puts the batteries in the flashlight and she presses the button. And she can hardly see any light in the flashlight because the ambient light of Walmart just brightens it up. And her daughter is disappointed. But her daughter looks up at her mama. And here's what the daughter asks. Mommy, 
Can we just go find some darkness? Can we just go find some darkness? And Christine says, absolutely. Now that conversation would haunt Christine. And as a matter of fact, that night she could hardly sleep thinking about what her, doctor, what her daughter asked. Can we just find some darkness? And she felt like the Lord at that time was tugging on her own life. And, um, and to make a long story short, that conversation in Walmart ended up being the story of how Christine Kane founded what may be the largest anti-sex trafficking ministry on the planet. And it was born just from the question of an innocent little girl who just said, can we find some darkness? Church at Brooks Avenue, it's time to find some darkness. In church at Brooks Avenue, you ain't got to look very hard to find it. You don't have to wait very long. There is a story, or there's a passage in Daniel at the very end of the book. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. It says this. It's not on screen, so we'll have to do it old school. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So, here's how I'm going to close the sermon this morning. Take your finger, do like this. Everybody, everybody can do this. We're going to sing an old song. Maybe it's been a while since you've sang it. But let's sing this together. This little light of mine, you know that I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, you know that I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, you know that I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, oh yes. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm not going to let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine, not from Satan, it out, I'm going to let it shine, won't let Satan, it out, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, oh yes, this little light of mine, you know that I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, you know that I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, you know that I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, yes. Brooks Avenue. Can we just find some darkness and let our light shine? Thank you. Thank you, Ken. In the midst of the darkness, the darkness out here and the darkness in here, in the midst of the exile that we live in every day on this earth, in the midst of suffering, of tears, 
of things present and things to come. Our faith is in Christ alone. And in the midst of all of that, we have blessed assurance because of his faithfulness. Sing with me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. not have communion um, the bread and the wine I think I see somebody over here we do have people who come and bring it to you if you raise your hand prepare to share in this meal together let us remember the love poured out for us and on us and given to us anew each week
Good morning, everyone. Please turn with me to Matthew 26. I'm going to start in verse 20. <clears throat> now, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Jesus, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't take much experience in any type of organization, whether it's a career or in a band or on a team of some sort, to know <clears throat> that when management identifies that someone is working deliberately to sabotage the team, once they sniff that out, they let them go immediately, quickly as possible to avoid further damage. So in Matthew 26, Jesus addresses Judas's betrayal, or, or he addresses his own betrayal, just before the Lord's Supper. He wants to get that out of the way, and I think then get down to what was about to be more important. He doesn't exactly fire Judas. Um, well, he just kind of calls him out. But you might want to say he, he kind of takes his resignation. Surely it's not I, Rabbi. No. Well, you, you said it yourself. John's account in uh, chapter 13 uh, makes it clear that Judas left immediately at this point. Now, in, our, in our present day and age, a dismissal of such a team member would probably be followed by some sort of announcement from HR or something to the mass public that Judas is no longer with our organization or that we found the conduct of Judas to not be aligned with our core values or um, my personal favorite that um, Judas uh, has been dismissed to pursue new opportunities, you know. Um, ever notice in reading through this and in other accounts too that it doesn't take long for his role to be backfilled? And I don't mean as treasurer. Because in, there's even in some accounts where the, the other disciples really don't know why he left. And some, one of them even thinks that um, he left to maybe go settle up because of the, the expense of the evening. <clears throat> what I'm referring to were his unwritten job duties. And you can call him what you want, but it's apparent that he was a saboteur. The director of en enmity. I can't even say the word enmity or the chief fruit spoiler, if you will, the fruits of the Spirit. He was going to make sure none of that had a chance to manifest and do the good that Christ was trying to make happen. The disciples quickly moved to this void that Judas has left in his role, his unwritten role, and begin bickering about who is the greatest. Later, they can't even stay awake to guard him <laughs> while he's trying to pray that he doesn't have to do this very thing that's going to save them all. And Peter indeed goes on to deny him three times. So now as we gather, we examine ourselves as we take in this memorial. And we ask, is it I, Rabbi? Am I working against the mission? Pray with me, please. Father, we're so very hum humbled by the way that you love us, take care of us, know what we need before we ask, 
and provide for us in ways that we just can't comprehend or fathom in our own worldly ex experiences of how you've made those choices. I pray that as we take these, that we would have extreme gratitude for uh, the sacrifice that your son made for us, and in turn, that we would live to glorify him and you. In his name of Christ, I pray. Amen. I'm going to continue in John 13, verse 31. Now, therefore, when he had gone out, and he, the he is Judas. Now, therefore, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now as I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. One of the reasons um, I'm glad that we partake of this every Sunday morning is because of all the reminders that, that come with this memorial. The reminder that there's a reason why that job is still vacant and not to take it. The reminder that we have a helper in the Holy Spirit. A reminder of the new covenant shared at this table just after Judas left, to love each other as Christ loved us. Which in turn, if you turn that commandment around, means there's a ton of people in this room who are loving you right now and loving me. Which is a reminder that because of Christ's love for our Father, he gave his life to cover our imperfections. Pray with me, please. Father God, we continue this memorial and thankful for the sacrifice of your son. I thank you for this body. I pray that as we grow together in faith, that we will do great works in your name and our faith will grow. And as a result, so will our works and just abounds and that our, our body here would grow stronger and unified all to your glory. We thank you for forgiving our sins. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. This song reminds us why. Guess who ultimately owns all the real estate? This is my father's world. And
Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we, we come into your presence today with, with hearts full of gratitude to, for this day that you've given us, for the time to, to come together, God, and, and to be with your people, to be with your church, God, and to be with our family. God, we're so thankful for, for this service and, and, and the words that we've heard, God, and the, the words that you've sent um, for us to hear. God, help us to be lights. Help us to be the type of people that when people look at us, God, they see your son and they see you, God. They know that we, we have a hope and that we have joy in our hearts because we have you with us, God. God, help us to continuously dedicate ourselves to finding the darkness in this world, both the ones that are inside of us, God, that you, that you push out the more that we let you in, God, and also the ones that are out there that, that you have called us to to bring your light to God. We're so thankful that you have, you have loved us the way that you've loved us, God, so unconditionally, without us having done anything to deserve it or to earn it, God, yet you continue to love us, and we're thankful for that. God, we continue to ask that you please be with those who are in our hearts and minds who are dealing with physical ailments or spiritual ones, emotional ones, each one of us in our own world and those that are common to us here at this congregation, God. We ask that you continue to just draw us near to you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. I would have just tried to hop up on here on the stage like our test, but I'm past those days. Um, just a quick announcement, and if Michael or Donald can put the journey group announcement on the screen, if you have it. If not, it's in your. This thing broken. Um, it's in your bulletin uh, handout today. Um, from 2007 to about 2015, for work I had to travel almost a million and a half miles. It's incredible on a plane. That doesn't include train and a lot of other things. A lot of dinners with people, a lot of activities with others. And, and at night at dinner in these countries um, that I had to go to, they would ask about my family and was I worried about them and were they, you know, what were they doing? And I, and I would always talk about our journey group because there were people like Michael and Anna Leffler in our group and Rocky and Karen Nelson who aren't here anymore, but I would tell them that from the bonds that, and not just them, but the group, that I didn't worry about my family. I knew that if something happened to me in these countries, that this group was my family, and that they would take care of Missy and the three boys. I think journey groups at times, in small groups, we, we think of as something else we need to do. I don't want you to think of it that way. God can use you in so many different ways in other people's lives if you're connected. This day and age, we're so isolated in so many ways. COVID has accelerated a lot of those isolations that have already been occurring. Yes, it takes some time to be there for other people, to be there in the group. Um, it is a commitment. But the commitment that we're called to is first to God but we're also called to love each other. And I would encourage you, Mike, can you stand? I think everybody knows Mike, but if you are not involved in a journey group now, um, get to Mike or the elders and we'll connect you with one. And if you wanna be a journey group leader, Mike is in the process of in you know September. And if, if you decide in November to be a journey group leader, you just let Mike or the elders know. But it's, it's a, and a very important part of the body here. And then we also want to make, put it in our neighborhoods where we're also inviting our friends and neighbors. Last thing quickly is there was a, uh, on Brooks and the congregation's behalf, there was a um, donation of $5,000, 10,000 total, but to two relief or Church of Christ relief organizations for the flooding. And there are other activities that are underway for support of other um, disaster relief as well as Ukraine that 
we'll be talking about in the coming days. So thanks. If you're not involved in a journey group, I would encourage you to get connected. And if you want to lead one, please see Mike. Thanks. <laughs>